Good morning, Cecil. Good morning, Lucas. You look chipper and cheery this morning. Mornings. I'm usually happier in the mornings than the afternoons. So. But, hey, listen, it, it's uh, it's poor Michael that we should all feel for having to show up to to be present for these super early a.m. recordings. You it know, really if is. If we were he- on the right coast instead of the wrong coast, we wouldn't have this problem. Well, we're in the middle, so it doesn't matter. But it's uh, <laughs> yeah, poor, poor Michael. He. He's like, can't we schedule these at like noon or one? Not uh, <laughs> not eight in the morning. He comes in about seven, gets set up. Yeah, oh, it's a, man. something. Um, all right. Got a question for you. This one's okay. a, around marketing a little bit. Okay. And so uh, uh, this right was now? posted in the... Do what? That's a, there's a lot of those right now. There are. There yeah. are definitely a lot of those right now. Uh, a lot of shops saying that they're slow. Mm-hmm. And and I'm sure that everybody's seen that. I've been a little bit slower than what I want to be. But um, Sean says, what can I do to increase my car count in February when historically it has sucked every year? Throwing money into marketing doesn't seem to change it. It's especially slow with a mild winter. Cecil, what do you say to that? <sighs> First of all, um, you can't do something in February to increase February. Right. Unless you want to spend a whole lot of money. Yeah. So you look at your trends, you build your trend line, and you say, you know, I uh, looks like February is a slow month for me, typically. By the way, it's slow for everybody. Um, uh, typically, uh, amongst our clients, we have, you know, 10% kind of complaining uh, uh, any given month. So yeah. we all have a lull, right? Um Oh, wow, I just got an echo. Can you hear the echo? I can't hear that. Okay, it's it's gone again. It's Michael screwing with me. Um, <laughs> so we, you know, we 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 track our marketing uh, uh, every month, and we look at our car count, and we look at our our sales as a percentage of car count, average repair order, things like that. And we take a look at those things, and we get to know the patterns of our business. Uh, yeah. There's a thing called a weekly report that will really help you determine, um, you know, where your business runs best, where it doesn't run well, et cetera. And then you go, let me see what I can do about six weeks before that with marketing. We should always have a couple of things up our sleeve that's not yeah. normal that we might do. Okay. Um, you know what? This kind of pisses me off a bit. We have the, the Mars Marketing Conference going on okay. next month, uh, a month from now, yep. on the 21st, 22nd, 23rd of uh, March. Got to think what month I'm in. Uh, <laughs> it is early. And, and uh, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is here. Oh, wow. I'm going to okay. give away four Mars Conference tickets. Wow, that's yeah, crazy! It's, man. it's a it's it's worth a little over eight hundred dollars. That's crazy, okay? Cecil. Are you and sure? And you, you get, you know what? I can do what I I can I get to do what I want to do. See, okay. that's why I'm a small business owner. That's the other reason why I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I'm not good working with other people, so yeah. I, I I I get to you know do something crazy if I want to do something crazy. Um, we're gonna give away okay. four tickets here, Lucas. Okay. And uh, what what they're going to do is they're going to email me, Cecil at weartheinstitute.com. Okay. And they're going to say, I here's why I want to come to the Mars Conference. Okay. We're going to have the best of the best from every section of marketing. Um, now, I always say that owners don't, they shouldn't be their marketing people. They're not right. qualified. That'd be like, you know, after 25 years of not working on cars, having me fix your, you know, uh, 2023 Ford pickup. You, right. you don't want me working on your truck, okay? Right. I'm not qualified. I'm qualified to teach people how to do things like run their business properly, financially, um, to talk about marketing and, and things that you can do to increase the consistency, um, right. So we're going to give away four tickets. All right. Okay. You tell me just in a in two sentences why you should be here, and we will send you a link uh, and get you. I'll have uh, Joey uh, get a hold of you, 
get you all signed up. Now we're not gonna we're not gonna fly you out here. You got to get here on your own. Some sweat you know, equity, drive, hitchhike, whatever. You got to put something into it. But uh, we're gonna have uh, uh, some of the top marketing people talk about what's going on in AI and and where's the future of this going. I've had some really interesting conversations in the past week about all of this. All right. So now I'm going to go back to your question because I think it's a okay. really important question. Um, okay. I need to do things that are are going to keep me having a more consistent business. And one of the things I can do, and I'm going to tell you about a conversation I had yesterday with one of my clients. Okay. okay. So they've been talking about car count. And I said, um, are you booking the customer's next appointment? And they said, right. Uh, the, you know, weeks ago, they said, yeah, absolutely, I, I am. So last night, we're still not a good, consistent car count. Now, by the way, booking their next appointment isn't going to help me today. That's going to help me four months out, five months out, yeah. depending on yeah, what my schedule is. So I said, are you booking the next appointment? He says, well, we're we're trying to. And you want to you wanna upset Cecil, give me the trying word. Right. I said, okay, you had 58 cars come in so far this month. How many of those booked an appointment? That, did you book an appointment for? Yeah. He said, well, I think we have two. And I said, well, you're not trying very hard, are you? <laughs> That's okay. exactly, so, exactly right. So are we trying to book appointments? Are we booking appointments? You yeah. book their appointment. These people, um, they, don't, they don't know what's best for their car. You do. Um, right. Someone comes into my shop. Doesn't matter what we're doing. If we're doing an oil service, we have a six-month service schedule, 6,000 miles for our clients. Okay. okay? So if we're going to do a minor service on your car, we're going to schedule you six months out. Now, if I don't do a minor service, if you come in for anything else, don't have yeah. your car serviced, I'm going to look at your mileage and the age of the vehicle, and I'm going to make some guesses and I'm going to say, when was the last time you had your car serviced? Right. If you don't know, I'm going to tell you, you need to let us service it today and get you on a schedule with that. If, if I look at the sticker and you had it done two months ago, since I have a six-month schedule, I'm going to book you out to July uh, four months from now, right? Yeah. Because And I'm going to take that sticker down and put a new sticker up. It's my sticker renewal program. You know how those things okay. fade. You can't read them. So I want one up there that they can read and understand, and I want to give them an appointment. So right. if you're booking appointments, not and, and you don't ask about it. You don't say, can I please have you book an appointment? Uh, and you say, look, I don't know what you're doing in July, uh, but on the 22nd, which is a Friday, because you're here on Friday, we're filming yeah. this on Friday, um, I've booked you an appointment and you don't have to worry about it. Because about three weeks before, you're going to get a text. It's going to say, hey, we've got you scheduled for an appointment. Um, right. uh, please, if you cannot make it, let us know because we've set aside time with our technicians to do this work. Right. Okay? And then about three days before, you're going to get another one of those. And if you're not ready, if you don't feel like I need to do it right now, if you, you know, uh, can't make it because you got a hair appointment, whatever, just let us know and we'll reschedule you. Right. Okay. Go ahead and get now, on the schedule. Yeah. And, and, and I had posted notes with our, our business name and logo and, and, and phone number and website. Right. Yeah. And I would. I would write their appointment on it and hand them a series of post-it notes. Not okay. one, but the whole pack. Because right. they take that home, they put it on their desk, and then they look at my company every single day. That's a good idea, Cecil. Okay? One That's of the a cheapest, slick idea, buddy. One of the cheapest forms of advertising. Plus, I'm taking those posts. When I go to my BNI group, when I go to my Chamber of Commerce meeting, I got my pockets loaded with post-it notes. Chamber of Commerce, we always went to the bank or, you know, somewhere like that. We went to some uppity business, and we would go. There'd be wine and hors d'oeuvres, and I'd be walking around dropping my Post-it notes on people's desks. 
Next morning they come in, there's a series of post-it notes That's on there. That's pretty desk. slick, dude. I, I'm not going mean, to lie. I'm, I'm already thinking about which vendor I'm going to call asking for post-it notes. Cheap. Cheap, cheap, cheap marketing, and yet you're on their yeah. desk. And it's funny because I would go, like, I, we, we went to the bank, and about a year later I go back to the same bank, and my post-it notes are still on people's desks. Yeah. It's, 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 if you're not doing these things, then don't complain to me about marketing, okay? Yep. And, and so, in our, in our company, we did a thing called a preferred customer program, all right? So, yep. kind of a high-end shop. We washed your car when you came in. We had loaner cars for you. Uh, we had a windshield treatment called an Aquapel. Cost me at the time about three fifty. I think they're about six fifty now. Um, right. And and so once a year, if you were a preferred customer, uh, not only did you book your appointments, but when you came in, you got a loaner car, which I would have done anyway. You got, yeah. and I can go. You you know me. I can go off on so many tangents. I'm going to try to stay right, right. Yeah, in the marketing area, right? But but. You got a loaner car, you got your car washed, which I also would have done anyway. And you got yeah. a windshield treatment, which is worth, I don't know, at the time, it, we, I think we said it was like worth about $130. And it's, it's right. three, at the time it was $3.50 worth of chemical and five minutes worth of putting it on your windshield um, right. to repel rain. And, and my customers ate that up. We had six appointments a day scheduled for six months. Wow. Every day we started with six appointments. Yeah, and, and think about your business. If you uh, this morning, if you if you walked in your shop, and there were six appointments every day for the next six months already scheduled out, and you knew that ninety two percent of those people were going to show up. Yeah. Okay. Um, That's huge, you, man. You, you want to create it. Okay. So so now I'm. It's um. I don't know. Uh, May, June, July, and I know February is going to suck. Why am I not scheduling people into February? Yeah. I could schedule and, and February a little heavier. And, and here's the thing. I, I went to the dentist the other day, right? Uh -huh. And they've already got a calendar built out for me for my visits for the next two years, right? Yeah. And, and they, they hey, listen, you're one of our great clients. Really appreciate you coming in. Here's what we have available. Now, this is our client-only schedule. So we we don't offer this schedule to anybody to else. everybody. Yeah. And and so here you are. If you'll just tell us if these dates work for you and they hand me the calendar. Right. Yeah. Think about that for a minute. It, it, you know, one of the things that frustrates me is we hear shop owners all the time say that won't work here. I can't do that in my shop. You yeah, don't right. understand my demographic. You don't know what it's like here. That's BS. So that's when absolute I, BS. Before I leave the industry. All right. Before I die, I'm going to write a book. And the title is Cecil, You Don't Understand, okay? Because every single day, every single day, uh, you know, Cecil, um, parts margin, I uh, read an article about parts margin this morning. Um, yeah. Uh, parts margin, uh, you don't understand, here in Minnesota, uh, people won't pay 58% parts margin. You can't get it, right? Except yeah. I've got three, four different clients up there. And the client that's telling me they can't get it isn't. And the other three are getting it, right? Yep. So, you know, uh, uh, go down to North Carolina, Arkansas. You can't get parts margin here. Sure you can. You know how you get it? You ask for it. You create value around it. You know, you, yep. you, you make sure you have a good warranty. You make sure you buy a quality part. It, it, it's, it's insane that while we're complaining – about not having enough money and not getting paid enough for our technicians. And we're actually worried in the industry that we're not going to have enough technicians. Two more guys, uh, uh, I think in your... Yeah, uh, just this morning. Just this just morning. Just this morning said they're leaving the automotive industry. Uh, we can't pay them, and yet we're afraid to charge, get parts margin, et cetera. Uh, yeah. Marketing. Um, back to back. Whew. Come on, Cecil, back. Um, uh, local involvement, BNI chamber. Uh, oh, but Cecil, I went to a BNI meeting. It was horrible. Okay, go get involved in the BNI and make it good. Do the work, right? Yeah. I, I hear him say all the time, but but I don't fit in. I don't fit in. <laughs> fit in. Listen, 
Change right. your shirt. Like, that's your job as a business you know? owner. And maybe that's yeah. the problem. We we talk all the time about technicians turned owners. The job of being a business owner is not the job of being a technician. And being a good technician does not make you a good business owner. I'll never forget Tim uh, Kite talks about it in one of his videos because he's talking about, you know, he goes into these hospitals to teach leadership. And he said they always make the best clinicians the leader or the manager of the hospital. And he said, but the problem is, is what makes you a good clinician does not not equate to you being a good leader, right? And so if you want to be a good shop owner, you're going to have to get good at going to be in I meetings. You're going to have to get good at engaging with chamber events. You're going to have to get good at these things. It's not something you can just say, no, no, I don't want to do that part. This is not a decision you get to make when you're a business owner. That's the part you got to do. So th- thinking back, you know, I don't know, 45 years ago, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a young guy dropped out of college. I don't want to go get a job somewhere because I'm, you know, I'm very shy and uh, I don't even want to go apply for jobs because it scares me. And uh, my dad has a shop. I call my dad and uh, I say, hey, um, I'm going to be a technician in your shop. You're going to teach me how to be a mechanic. Okay. Right. And and I don't know what my dad did. Maybe he didn't sleep for three days after that. But I go to work as a mechanic. I don't even know where to put the oil in the damn car. 19 years old, right? Yeah. That's how good I was. How did I get good? How how did I become a good technician? Education, you know, uh, my dad, his partner, this is where you do this. This is how you do this. And practice, doing it over and over and making some mistakes. If you you don't fit in and you don't feel comfortable at a B&I group meeting or a chamber mixer in your in your town then go to more of them yes okay get some practice uh practice Absolutely. shaking people's hands i i would go to these meetings and and i am an introvert i know that nobody knows that in this industry they're like holy shit that guy will he'll talk anytime about anything he right. he can't be an introvert but i am that's how i test and um i i I, at those meetings, I would take business cards, post-it notes, and I would go talk to people. I, I'd see somebody by themselves. I'd go over and I'd say, hey, I haven't seen your car in my shop yet. Yep. Well, 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 yeah, 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 we, we, we got a shop. Well, when you're ready for the best, you know, when you want to have the best experience ever, and I'd hand them my card and I'd walk away. And, you know, what can they do? What's, I always yeah. think, what's the worst they can do? You know, is the guy going to pull a gun out of his pants and shoot me? Or is he going right. to go, you know, is he going to go, oh, that guy was an idiot. And by the right. way, if or, he goes, or, that guy hey, was I an idiot, were, I, you guys are what too do I care? Or, yeah, yeah, what do I care? You know, right. it's, um, yeah. life is about, life is about get out there and play the game. Yeah. Right? Get out yep. there and play the game. And, and I'm going to play the game everywhere that I can that's going to help me be successful. If you're not if you're not involved in your community, then you're going to have a suck February. Yeah. Right? I go to a chamber mixer meeting. I used to go to a chamber mixer meeting. I come back come away with two appointments. Uh, right. I go to a BNI group. I'd come away with two or three appointments. So in February, I probably should do more more BNI chamber meetings, right? You know, I should and- make sure I booked appointments. And then you need to have something up your sleeve. A crazy right. idea that you don't do very often. You keep it for two, three times a year when you're really slow. Uh, yeah. We did pizza day. Called up the okay. uh, one of my clients, owned a pizza place. I said, uh, I want to buy 10, you know, family-sized pizzas, whatever they want on them. You know, what's it going to cost me? I don't remember. It was just 20 bucks a piece or whatever. And I said, great, I'm, I'm buying 10. I'm going to need certificates for that. Um, okay. and, uh, then I, uh, I sent out messaging to my clients. I said, you know, February is usually a tough month for us, you know, with the weather and everything, business slows down a little bit. So we're going to have a pizza day for the first 10 clients that call in. Um, we're going to offer you a family size pizza at Giuseppe's blah, 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 uh, no charge just to make an appointment. I sent that out to all my clients. Within an hour, I had 19 appointments. Wow. Okay. 19 okay. in a February. And and here's what I said. Again, it was 10. 
Number 11, I said, congratulations, you're number 10. You just made it. <laughs> number 12, congratulations, you're number 10. You just made it. And then I called yeah. the pizza parlor back up and I said, hey, I'm going to need nine more certificates. Yep. And, and so uh, another thing, here I go again. You can cut this, you can cut this up, do whatever you want to do with it. We, we have, um, we, we, we think that we're limited, right? We're not limited. Yeah. I can do what I want. I need to have some things up my sleeve to, yeah. to, to pull out, but I need some consistency in my marketing and I need to have, um, tracking going to shops every day. And I say, uh, how many people came in from chamber? You do, you do chamber. How many came in from chamber? I don't know. How many people came in from, uh, you know, Google? You're paying $4,500 a month yeah. for for your website and your SEO, SEM, your Google ads. How many people came in? Uh, I don't know. And and I listen, I'm, I'm guilty of it. I've been, I have historically been terrible at getting sources. And, it, it, you know, here's the thing is I already know. I'm, I'm asking in conversation. I'm not even coming right out and saying, yeah, how did you hear about us? Just it's, not recording it's I'm talking it. to them, yeah. and I'm building a relationship, and they're telling me about how they heard about it, and I just don't track it, yeah. right? And that's that's ridiculous because I've got the information. I'm just not putting it in somewhere that I can utilize it. Every SMS has this, yeah, right. And, and, you, and why we don't use it, I don't know. You need to have a, you need to have a, you need to understand your how your business ebbs and flows, yeah. And you need to be prepared for an ebb that you're not used to, yeah. But you also need to calm down. Uh, I got I got a client uh, father about my age mm-hmm. son about Kent's age. Um, the son is is taking over the business, running the front, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, they had a slowdown. Now dad's been in business for forty two years, forty five years. Yep. And um, we're in a meeting, and the son is like freaking out. What do I do? What do I do? Oh my god! What you know? What do we do? It's the business is slow, you know. And dad is like, first thing we do is we calm down. Because, yeah. you know, we've had a lot of slow times before. They don't last that yeah. long, et cetera. So, but the son is like, oh, I got to cut my marketing. I can't spend that money. I got to. Are you kidding me? That's dangerous, man. Yeah. And and I, look, I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I think that that value between your experience bringing Kent into your business and being able to share that, because there's a lot of, of sons and daughters taking over repair shops. From parents, and I think that's an important um, aspect or cultural deal in a shop that that somebody that knows how to handle that and has experienced that should be part of that. I think that's really important. But but here's the thing: is we're seeing exactly what you talked about over and over again. There was a there was a comment in one of the groups. I can't remember which one it was, and it said, "Hey, do you guys lower your prices when it gets slow?" No, no, I raise my you prices. Don't do when that. It gets you don't slow. ever do that. <laughs> and and you know, I was talking to somebody a while back, and he was talking about the fact that you know, well, well, the thing is, is those other shops down the street are really busy, and and because I've raised my prices, I'm really slow. And no. I said, right, but but you're talking about lowering your prices. You realize you're making the same amount of money, being as slow as you are right now. Or with more. way less cars than they've got. And they're dealing with all of the troubled clients. They're dealing with all the people that don't have any money. They're dealing with all the super broken, junky cars. Right? Like, you don't want that. You, they're, they're cleaning up the mess, and they're not making any money doing it. So when we, when we start coaching people, um, we yep. look at their pricing. We look at their margins. We look at mm-hmm. their productivity. We look at a lot of things. We also, you know, we look at marketing, and we do an evaluation, and... And all yeah. of that. So, got this guy comes in, and uh, one of the first things we do, uh, and shoot me if you feel like you have to, go online and, and talk about how it's all BS, um, is we raise their labor rate. Yeah. Okay? Because nobody's labor rate is where it should be. All right? Right. So, yeah. you're going to spend money on a coach or a consultant. Uh, where does that money come from? Right? comes yeah. from the client. So raise yep. your labor rate. I, oh, I can't afford coaching. You can't afford not to have coaching. I raise agree. your labor rate two bucks an hour, you know, and see how many people complain and pay for a coach who's going to help you in all areas of your business. Anyway, so we we go in and we raise labor rate. Okay, and so for like three or four months, this guy's hitting records. He's 
He thinks we we walk on water. I mean, he's like, oh my gosh, we, I've made more money in the last three months than I made in the last three years. And you're, yeah. okay, great, great. You know, we got other stuff to do. Well, all of a sudden, wintertime comes, okay? And uh, business slows down. And he's, he's writing me. He's like, oh, I think I raised my prices too high. I think everybody knows. I think all the customers got together down at the donut shop. They're all talking yep. about how I'm overpriced now, and they're not yep. going to bring their cars to me. And he's all paranoid about it all. And I, and so I'm like, no, no, that's never happened. In the 20-plus years that I've been coaching and consulting, I yeah. have told 25,000 shop owners <laughs> to raise their labor rate, if, if one. And they've all gone home and raised their labor rate, and not one has chased away more than a couple of customers that they should have chased away years ago. Years ago. Right? Yeah. And so anyway, he's all paranoid. And I'm like, okay, let's let's take a look at this logically. Let's look at our reviews. So we go and look at our reviews, and we actually have more five-star reviews now than we had before. Yeah. Right? So the customers are happy. I said, well, let's call some people. So we get a list of 20 people who haven't come in and since we raised our labor rate. Right? Yeah. And we call them up. And we're like, hey, how are you doing? We haven't seen you in a while. Uh, you know, I'm working with on my database. want to make sure I have the right, uh, 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 is this the right phone number, address, email, blah, yeah. blah, blah. Yeah. And then I get around to, oh, we haven't seen you in a little bit. What's up? Oh, geez. Has it been that long? I, bet, I guess I better schedule my car in. It's not, yeah. they're not like, oh, you guys are $20 more for a service, so I'm not coming in. They're, yeah. they're just, they have busy lives like you and me. And if you're not already pre-scheduling them in, they're not going to plan to come in. For it's sure. Just, for sure. It's and, and so two months later, you know, I'm having a conversation with him. We're hitting records in his shop now yeah. again. We just had a little dive. We're hitting records. I says, um, hey, uh, hey, Tom, um, what do you think about we raised our price too high? He smiled. I, I had a meeting with him two weeks ago. Yeah. And I've been talking about going up another $15 an hour because it's been about a year and right. uh, we need to get up there. And he, he kept telling me, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Okay. Yeah. So I have a meeting with him, sit down and he says, I raise, I, I want you to know I raised my labor rate this morning. I said, well, you told me you weren't going to do it. He said, well, I went to the dealer and I asked him what their price is and they're $45 more per hour than I am. He said, yep. then I got curious and I called around to several of the shops that I know. And I said, hey, you know, what's your labor rate? And they, they were $15 more than I was. Yeah. And he said, yep. I'm not going to let them be $15 more than me. I need to be $15 more than them. And he raised his labor rate. And, and you know what happened? Nothing other than the fact that he made more money. You know, so it, it's funny because I, I was talking to somebody yesterday, and, and he's a he runs a dealer near me. Really awesome guy, really smart guy, top notch human being. They're talking about prices and talking about like how they do their pricing, and he was sharing some intricate knowledge about how the dealer works and why they do what they do and how they do what they do. And uh, we were talking about local shops, and there's three or four local shops that are sixty five dollars an hour. And he said, "You know something?" He said, "I saw the other day." He said, I was on Facebook and he said, typically I don't go into those Facebook groups and read the comments because it stings a little bit. I'm the same way, right? I Like I panic about that stuff. I don't even like looking at it. And he said, I saw somebody made a comment about you and they said, this shop is the cheapest in town and they can handle uh, certain things, but I wouldn't take them anything complex. And then there's this shop and they're kind of the middle of the road shop and they can do a lot of the easy, basic stuff. And then there's L&N, but L&N is by far the most expensive shop in town, and they're by far the most competent shop in town. And I was like, man, I wear that with a badge of honor all day long, right? So of all the shops that, that we work with, and we've worked with a lot of shops over the years, we work with a lot of shops currently, Yeah, the shops that are higher priced are more consistent yeah. in their marketing, they're more consistent in their car count, average repair order, and they make more money. Yeah. So- if if you think cheap or less expensive is the thing that's going to get it done for you, you are naive. It is what, not going to get it done for you. What do you say to the shop owner? It, it, every single day, there's someone who posts in the groups that says, I don't market. I don't need to market. Word of mouth has always been what drives clients to me. I don't need any of that. What do you say to them? 
I would um, I would probably ask a few other questions, and I would probably find that they have a low labor rate. Okay, okay? they probably do great work. Don't get me wrong, but yeah. they probably have a lower labor rate. Like they're maybe a hundred dollars an hour when everybody else is one thirty five, one forty five, one fifty. So, right. and and they're dealing with older cars, etc. Um, that's a model, and if it's working for you, God bless. Yeah. But but at some point, right? So, um, brake jobs. When I used to do brake jobs, uh, you know, we used to rebuild calipers, and we'd uh, put a pry bar between the brake pad and the caliper, and we'd separate it, and, uh, you know, we'd uh, pull the caliper off, rebuild the caliper. Yeah. Easy, easy, peasy, piece of cake job, okay? Yeah. Um, and then came along, uh, uh, calipers that kind of screwed in. Yeah. Um, and you couldn't just pry it apart. Special equipment. You had to learn how to do the brake job differently. Right. And now they're even more sophisticated braking systems. You have to bleed it in a very specific way or it isn't going to stop the way it's supposed to. Right. And now we're getting some systems that even need to be programmed. So yeah. What's all that lead up to, Cecil? Okay. If I know how to do brake jobs this way and I don't learn how to do brake jobs the way they are today, yeah. I'm going to be a dinosaur and I'm going to be out of business. Yes. At some point, you need to have marketing and consistency of marketing and messaging because today's generations, you know, my generation, you found a good shop, you went there no matter what. Even if they screwed yeah. up, you kept going there because you knew them, you knew they were good people, et cetera. The consumers today do not have the same kind of loyalty. They can forget you yeah. real soon. How many ads? You're on Facebook, right? I know yeah. you are because I see you on Facebook. And, and so when you're in there, how many ads do you see? A bunch. Right? Um, A bunch. And, and, and so uh, 20 years ago, if I went on Facebook, right, how many ads did I see? If I went on Google, how many ads did I see? Well, first of all, I don't know how old Facebook is, but 20 right. years ago is probably right about the time they started. That's what I was going to say. As right? old as it makes you feel, it probably was about 20 years ago. So, so, but there wasn't the plethora of stuff in your face all the time. Yeah. There wasn't the new, uh, new guy coming in. Uh, you know, I, I, I belong to associations. I... I know all the shop owners. Uh, they've been the same shop owners for 20 years. Uh, occasionally, we get a new guy, but not very often. Now, you got a bunch of guys coming in the industry from internally and from externally. There's yeah. more competition. Market flood. Yep. And sooner or later, if you want to run a professional, consistent business, um, there's lots of things. You could say, look, Cecil, I don't want it to get too crazy. I'm really happy making hundred grand a year. Uh, I get to take my weekends off, whatever, and that makes you happy, then don't worry about marketing. Yeah, Who cares? Sure. But if you want to grow your business, if you want to grow with the times, if you want to buy that new $30,000 Mercedes scanner every couple of years, et cetera, you need to have consistency of marketing sure. and messaging. Absolutely. And, and so and what – go ahead. It's that reputation too. You want people in the neighborhood going, those LNN guys, they're expensive, but man, they know what they're doing. Yep. I mean, you, 100%. Yeah. And that's what it's all about. And so all I'm going to say to you folks is, is take Cecil up on his offer. You've pissed him off. Hey, hey, look, he's going to give away four sponsorships or scholarships to Mars, the marketing conference. He's putting his money where his mouth is. This man has consistently, time after time after time, man, he's out here dropping knowledge in these YouTube videos every single effing week just to help improve the industry, right? He doesn't get something from this. He's doing this because he's seen shop owner after shop owner and technician after technician and service advisor after service advisor struggling to make it financially. And he's giving you the answer to fix it. Take him up on his offer. Shoot him an email. Cecil, what's your email address? Cecil, C-E-C-I-L, at weartheinstitute.com. W-E-A-R-E-T-H-E-I-N-S-T-I-T-U-T-E.com. Love it, dude. Love it. Okay. 
All right. One more question. All right. Um, this is one that, that a gentleman's been messaging me. Uh, this is a guy that runs a diesel shop, and he sent me some numbers. And the first thing I said to him was, is, hey, gross profit per hour is not looking really great, buddy. Like, you might be doing a ton of work, and the parking lot might be completely full, but it doesn't look like we're actually making progress financially. It looks <laughs> like we're really busy, and we're doing a lot of stuff, and we've confused super busy with profitable. And that's something that I am guilty of. I've done it time and time again. And he says, so I've got a continuous run of six, seven power strokes needing a reseal. The crankcase ventilation clogs up and needs a front and rear cover re resealed, valve covers, etc. I've tracked consistently across three techs doing this job, and they've averaged 10 or more hours than I charged uh, than I charged for. And I think it's mainly due to cleaning. Do I bump my hours up on this job to offset their clock time? Because they've been steadily grinding on it and not screwing off, mainly due to the amount of decontamination and cleaning. Should we be charging for cleaning these engines up and doing these things? When when we get into these big jobs, right, they look at the book hour, they put the book hour on it, and they say, well, the tech's slow because he didn't get done in that amount of time. How do you handle it, Cecil? Two There's two questions in there, first of all. You never okay. run your business by volume. You run your business by dollars and profits, okay? okay? So cars does not equal success. Right now, there's this, I'll teach you how to make a million dollars in your shop. Do a million dollars worth of business a month. Anybody, any coach can teach you how to do a million dollars worth of business a month. Here's what your hour's worth. You need to build this many hours to do a million. Yep. You need to have this many techs. And you're going to have to have this many bays. And you're going to have to spend this much on marketing to make sure Pretty you have those simple customers. Equation, right? it, it, it really is. It drives me nuts that people are dropping their pants to find out how to do a million dollars a month. Right. Why don't we do this? Let me teach you how to make $250,000 in profit a month. Okay? That's a little more challenging, but it's a lot more rewarding. Now, one question. Second well, and, question. And I, I want to add into this, okay? I, I have said this for years. You can fix every single car on the planet that's broken right this minute and be just as broke as you are today, tomorrow, right? Fixing cars does not equate to you being profitable. Fixing cars does not fix your business profitability problem. Fixing cars does not fix the culture in your shop and fix the way that you feel. Being profitable fixes a lot of that. Yeah, it, money doesn't solve all problems, but damn, it gives you a good heads up. You know, <laughs> exactly it gives you some right. runway. So, okay, yep. now let's really talk about the real question here. Okay. Um, I've got a job, book time says it's 10 hours, but by the time we clean the vehicle up, scrape the old gaskets off, blah, 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 it's taking an additional 10 hours. Okay. Yep. Um, what do I do? Do I charge more or not? Oh, my God. You're going to pay a technician to do that work. My yeah. lawyer, I've got a lawsuit right now. I've got an employee suing me. You know? Okay. I don't think we did anything wrong. I guess the courts are going to tell us whether we did or not. Right. Um, I think we're in it right now about $20,000 with the lawyers, and we haven't even yet got our chance to go to court and speak up in court about it. All right? right. My lawyer charges me $500 an hour. When I send an email and he has to read that email, you get there's a, a tenth of an hour billed to me for his time to read yeah. the email. If you book, first of all, book time is not necessarily correct time. Yeah. Uh, the way my understanding of the way the book time is done, mm -hmm. they bring in an, a new car. They have they're going to replace the water pump. Okay. okay. They have a water pump sitting in a box on a shelf. They have all the tools laid out. Uh, they bring it into the bay. The tech is there ready to go. And they say, go. And the tech yep. works on the water pump. Okay. And they time it. Click. Took you four hours to do that water right. pump. And then they say, okay, let's do it again. And they do it multiple, multiple times. All right. And then they average the time. And then I think uh, the manufacturers now are saying, let's do average minus about 30%. Right. Just a, I've heard that. Right? So, because they, they want 
their cars to look like you don't have to spend money to maintain them. Yeah. So they're trying to even even some of the insurance companies are buying up these companies that now dictate the time. Right. They're trying I'm to get in that. there and lower the times. All right, now so um, it is a tech working on the same car. Okay. It's there's no grease, dirt, rust. Brand new um, car. The gaskets are new. Think about uh, I drive the the vehicle out of the dealership. Uh, I I pull it into my shop. I pull the thing apart. I just want to see how the engine works. So I I pull everything apart. Are those gaskets like twenty five year old gaskets that are stuck I'm on? Scrape them off and grind them off and yeah. Or do or do they all the junk off? Or so do they don't come off a lot easier? Put it back together, yeah. right? And then the other thing is my tech doesn't sit in his bay with the right parts and all the right tools laid out. And then pull the car and somebody pulls it in and he starts working on the car. My tech comes up, gets the work order, reads through it. If he's smart, looks up how you do the job, uh, on, you know, on whatever system we have. Just if he's never done it so he can go, I think this is how I need to do this and be aware of it. Then he goes and test drives the car. Then he pulls it in the bay, racks it, puts it in the air, and starts working on it. Yeah. Okay? When he's done, he's filling paperwork out. He's cleaning his bay. He's cleaning his tools. He's putting the bay back into shape, and and he's the one that's pulling the car out, not yep. somebody else doing it. Not a puller, so, not a, yeah. So, first of all, book time, we need to put 20 to 30% into book time on almost every single job. To make up for the stuff that book time never took right. into account, all right? Yep. And most of the shops that I work with, and I always say most now instead of all, but I would guarantee you that if there was one that isn't using a 20 to 30% labor matrix, right? Um, I would be surprised, okay? Yeah. Um, that's how you survive. And if my tech, so old days, Cecil's still working on cars. Now, I'm going to date myself. Ford Taurus right. comes in. First time. Needs yeah. a heater core. Look in the book. It says 2.8 hours. Uh, I'm a pretty progressive guy even back then, so I sold it for three. It yeah. took 11. You have to take the dash out of the car. There are no shortcuts. You can't yeah. bend stuff. You can't. I, and I would never drill right. through the dash and then put a you know, a uh, uh, metal or plastic cover where I drilled through. Um, yeah. I, I wouldn't do that. That's not the but, right way to do it. Yeah. But so the, the next time I needed to do a Ford Taurus, it was an 11-hour job. It wasn't yes. a three-hour job. Yep. The book wasn't correct. If what? you're – and, and also, God, I, I hate the fact that I keep going. Um, you You think, oh, my tech must not be very good because it's taking him – 10 hours to clean it up. Yeah. Excuse me, bull hockey. Your tech is good. That's what it takes. To do the you job know? right. And to we need to be thinking right. about the average tech doing the average job, not a junior tech or or a senior tech. A senior tech that's done that job 15 times is going to take less time. What do I bill for? The less time the guy takes or the time that he should have taken if he was an average Joe? Yeah. Right, I'm always billing the time he should have taken because he's learned how to do it right. I, he and I both get the advantage of that. Yeah, I'm o I'm, I'm OCD. My my uh, my son says I'm not, but I'm absolutely OCD. Um, when I'm in church and I'm bored, I count the scars on my hands. I have 154 scars on my hands. Okay, where do they come from? Working on damn cars. I earned that that extra time. You know? Yeah. I each of these sure. scars, I could point it out and I could say that's where I ripped my, you know, half my finger off when I was doing this job. Uh taught me how not to take tires off of a car. You know, that's where I, I stuck screwdriver through my uh, uh hand. That's 100%. that taught me how not to uh, hold hold something in one hand and try to screw it tightly. Um, that I, I learned that. And so here's the thing for me, and, and this is something that I'm personally guilty of, is that it is a fear thing when we look at the estimate, 
right? And and I have to be very careful about being on the front counter because I look at that and I recognize I've worked with that client. I don't want to lose that client. They've been a great client for years. Even though in my heart of hearts, I know I'm doing what's best for them. You know what I'm saying? I know that by making it profitable so I can pay my people more, so I can give them a good living, so I can provide benefits that everybody else provides. And and we know there is definitely a, and I'm not even going to say mechanic or, or technician shortage. I'm going to say skilled trade shortage because people are leaving the skilled trades at, at an, a phenomenal, astonishing rate, right? All skilled trades. Just and when so it's getting I, good. Yeah. Right? And so. You know, here's the thing is if I'm looking at that and I'm saying, well, you know, nobody else is here to fix the vehicle and and I know that I need to charge this to be profitable, I will still experience some of that fear, some of that uh, anxiety about charging them what I know I need to charge them. And so I see so many shop owners come in and they look at that ticket and they say, oh, my gosh. That looks awful high. And the client, the client complained, Cecil. The client said that 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 was really expensive. And I've been telling people for years, Cindy Pike, Cindy, I'm sorry, I got to call you out here, mm-hmm. right? We keep lowering this this parts margin back down, and she keeps saying, "Well, look, people are coming into the shop and they're saying that's expensive. You're more expensive than Joe down the street. I don't care. I do not care." Look, it's not that I don't care I'm more expensive. It's that the reality is, is this what is what it takes to make the business profitable? And what I hear time and time again as well, but somebody said something. People are going to complain no matter what your price is. You could you can make zero dollars on it, and they would tell you it's expensive if they don't have any money. You could give it to them. So I'm going to give away four tickets to the Mars conference. Yep. Cost me money. We got entertainment. We're we're paying for all kinds of great stuff, great meals. We're bringing yeah. in the uh, Change of the Industry podcast guys, you know, yep. et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's it's not it isn't cheap. Um, it, I, I'm I'm going to give away four tickets. I I have to make up for that somewhere. I can't yeah. I can't not or I go out of business. It's so not a charity. It's right. Uh, am I going to lose somebody to price? God, I hope so. Yeah. Right. I hope so. Otherwise, my price isn't somebody the other day. I, I get I get the same questions. You probably like you, you, if you said Cecil. Uh, you know, write down the questions that you get routinely. I, I get this question. Um, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to lose somebody. I need to lower my price. I think I need to lower my price because I've, I've got complaints. Okay. So I'm like, okay, how, how much did you raise your price? Well, we went up, uh, $5 an hour. I said, so you got, you got, um, uh, 2.8 hours on your ticket, average ticket. That's, 14 bucks. So yeah. the customer is complaining for $14 would be the yeah. customer that complains at the, the regular price. And if you gave it away, they would be the customer that complains. Yep. Now I said, yep. again, here's my ADHD. Marches back in the shop. Here's my ADHD to fix something for free. kicking in. One of the four that comes in that we give away yeah. tickets to is going to complain about what it, what it cost. All yeah. right. But but the but there was airfare, you know. But 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 right. It's a nature yep. of people. I, yep. I I think you get to a point when you've been in this business as long as I've been in this business that you're like, I just don't give a crap anymore. You know, I used to feel uh, more compassion for the the end user. I still do. I mean, shop owners. You know, you mentioned a couple of names. Um, uh, Certain people are going broke, and at the same time, they're lowering their price because they think that's why they're going broke. If they're chasing people away because their price isn't low enough, and and then how do you make a living? How do you ever make a living if you keep lowering your price every time somebody complains? You yep. you can't do it. Yep. I'm on with um, I'm on with Parts Tech yesterday uh, talking to yep. them about uh, they wanted to know about margins and markups and all of that they want to do some webinars so i'm like well here's here's how it goes here's what it is and they're like well do you really mark up dealer parts more than the dealer would sell them yes, and i'm like absolutely well, yeah i have to make money uh plus the dealer is not playing the game fairly they're right. telling you what the price to buy it in the parts department is 
and they're not telling you what the price to buy it in the service department on the car with a warranty guaranteeing yep. that it fixes the car, it's a different price. Yep. Um, and by the way, you want to go down to AutoZone and buy your part? Go down to AutoZone and buy your part. I won't put it on your car. I yep. can't guarantee that it's a quality part. I can't guarantee that it solves the problem. I don't make any money on it. So now my I'm going to have to not pay my tax. And it's just, you know, oh, we'll just raise our labor. Okay, great. Raise your labor, lower your parts margins. And what you're going to end up doing is cheating your technicians on time so you can have higher. One of your posts recently, you know, um, uh, someone saying, well, it was a big parts margin thing. Read it last night or today. Um, uh, 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 parts margin, parts margin, parts margin. You know, we I do a 35% margin on everything. Oh, yep. good God, right? I couldn't imagine. You know, welcome to the poorhouse. Um yep. You're going to be out of business before you know it at 35%. And then yeah. I'd never mark up parts more than the dealer does. Why not? I mean, most yep. of the shops that I work with do. And I, I guarantee you they don't have customers complaining about the part, uh, parts pricing. Other than, Jesus this is really expensive. What does that mean? I didn't plan my shop. Imagine being Cecil Bullard's shop. Right. You know? Poor, poor Tom and his, his staff up. Take my wife's vehicle in. They call me up, um, you know, and I'm like, they better do this right, okay? <laughs> so they're like, Cecil, you know, we checked the car out. Here's what you brought it for. Here's what that's going to cost, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, holy shit, $3,500? That car's a piece of crap. I hate that damn car. You know, and I go through this little tirade, right? Because yeah. I don't want to pay for this piece of crap car. And uh, and then finally I go, well, when can you have it ready? Right? It's just, it's like, what choice yeah. do I have? Either I go buy my wife a new car or I, yeah. I take care of the car she has. I got no other choice. Um, let me bitch a little bit. And then and then I'll let you go do ahead. Do your thing and yeah. you fix the car. And yeah. And, and what was it they always said in, in negotiations? The first one who talks loses. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, That's right. And and you know one of the things and and this is an upcoming video that we're gonna we're gonna ask this question but there's a video uh, we're gonna do with you where um, it's a gentleman saying like there's no way I could be more expensive than the dealer and still get clients like they're just gonna automatically go to the dealer because I was. The, you know and I so was. we're gonna talk about that just briefly two different experiences yeah we buy a a new Ford Exploder yeah. Uh, for the business, Kent's going to be driving that. Uh, we take it off the floor. They're a uh, they're a half a mile down this down the street, Main Street. Yep. Within a block of their business is entrance onto the freeway. Right. So we go we go to take it for a ride. Leave the dealer. We get on the freeway, fifty five miles an hour. There's a hell of a knock in the rear end. Right. Okay. Yeah. Just like someone's back there with a hammer. So right. we get back off the freeway. We pull it back in. And they go, well, we'll, uh, you know, you drive it around town. We'll get you in in a couple of days. So two days goes by. Kent shows up in the morning and there's a line of cars and there's an old yeah. guy out there. And the old guy's giving him the stink eye. Right. Because Kent's like, where do you want me to park? The guy's like, put the truck, oh, put it over there. Right. This is how the guy's talking to him. Yeah. You know, and then he gets out of the, the vehicle. Now, I just spent. Fifty-five thousand dollars on this thing, okay, yeah. and and not three days before he gets out of the vehicle, he goes in. There are seven or eight kiosks at Ford. He stands there for nineteen minutes before yeah. anybody will even look at him. Okay, so tell me, I can't <laughs> exactly be higher price than that. And and I'm going to tell you, if you've ever got on the subreddit for service advisors and read what service advisors at dealerships, primarily for the most part, not saying all of them, think of their clients, you would mm. understand why, right? Mm. And, yep. and y y the sad reality of it is, is the people that work in this shop out here, they all have a connection and a relationship with the clients that come through the door. They care about them. They're interested in their best interest. They're focused in doing what's best for them. And to them, it's important because this is part of the identity of who they are as part yeah. of this business, right? Yeah. 
Whereas, well, and we we seen, all want to be loved too, right? Yeah. Well, but what we've seen is part of that dealership culture is, and and you know, I've I've had some experiences where we've had people from dealerships. Part of the dealership culture and the mentality that happens there is it's me against you. It's the manufacturers really sticking it to both of us, but you're not going to get me. I'm going to get paid for this. And and every compensation package is set up in such a way to build a, a wall between the consumer and between the service advisor and between the technician because it's all focused on that's the only way they get paid. And at the right? dealership, for the last 20 years, they've been squeezing the techs, squeezing yeah. the times, squeezing the service advisors, and 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 believe it or not, squeezing the client. They yeah. they have to because they're they're not they have too much expense. Uh, the dealership model, as we have known it for the last twenty years, that yeah. model is going to change. It has to yes. change very much because so. it's not a model for success for the client or the business. It just yeah. isn't hundred percent. So and it, it I agree will with you hundred percent. Yeah, and it we have to run different. Work. We have to run different business, and there are some things that come along with that, which is yeah. it's a little more personal. So when a customer's unhappy, it's a little it hurts a little more Absolutely. for us. It does, and it and does. it probably should, right? Uh, rightly yeah. so. If I'm not doing it right, I need to take care of that customer. But yeah. we have the advantage in the in the automotive service industry. We have the advantage over the dealerships because we yeah. have the ability to have that relationship and to make uh, better decisions faster. And uh, customers, by and large, appreciate that and are more than happy to pay for that, at least in I my agree. experience. Speaking of relationships, join us uh, March 21st through March 23rd in Ogden, Utah, for the Mars Marketing Conference. And uh, Cecil here has graciously offered to give away some tickets because he's pissed off that you people are not marketing the way you should be maybe marketing doesn't mean you're marketing the right way so shoot cecil an email if you're interested in that giveaway a lot of money is wasted in marketing because you're spending money on things that aren't getting you what you need uh, yes. you need to have a plan you need to have a budget you need to have a strategy we have the best experts here to help you with in all those areas and i do want to make a point anyone that that comes and speaks at a conference for us our conferences are not sales conferences. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. There'll be suppliers here and people you can talk to about different stuff. But if you're speaking and you start doing sales in one of my classes, you will never again come to the Institute. You won't get in front of my <laughs> clients again. Out. We don't do that. So this is about helping shop owners understand the future, what they need to do now to be successful and how to how to manage this to to make the best bang for their buck for marketing. Exactly. <coughs> Can't wait to see you guys there. Cecil, thank you, sir. Thank you.